Good evening. Thank you all for coming and thank you for the architecture group for canceling their beer event tonight and joining us here. My name is Hashem Sarkis. I'm the Dean of the School of Architecture and Planning and I am here uh, to present to you Roberto Mangabera Unger, our guest speaker in the lecture series, Our Intellectual Commons. Roberto, thank you very much for extending a hand to, build a, to help us build our intellectual commons. Our school is really a mine of intellectual wealth, but very much like the rest of MIT, this mine has been fragmented all over the campus. The physical fragmentation of the school has really led to an intellectual disintegration. We suffer from lack of collaboration, discussion, and even lack of simple knowledge of each other's work, let alone each other's names. On Wednesday, for example, and over the monthly student lunch in my office, two fourth-year PhD students in the same department met each other for the first time. As we are working to build our new spatial commons in the Metropolitan Warehouse Storage Building on Mass Ave, we are in parallel working on rebuilding our intellectual commons to explore what binds us together, not necessarily in terms of shared values, but more shared matters of concern, and more importantly, given our fields, art, architecture, planning, looking for shared spaces for possible action. Last year, sociologist Saskia Sassen brought us together in a series of discussions around globalization. And then Mary Robinson, the former president of Ireland, brought us together around climate change and human rights. Tonight, it's our honor to host Roberto Mangabera Unger around the theme of the knowledge economy. A Brazilian philosopher and politician, Unger is the Roscoe Pound Professor at the Harvard Law School. He has developed his views and positions across many fields, including legal theory, philosophy, religion, social and political theory, progressive alternatives, economics, and I would add architecture as well. His works include Politics, a three-book series outlining a program for social reconstruction as a radical alternative to social democracies and Marxism, Passion, an essay on personality, with Cornel West, the book The Future of American Progressivism, then The Religion of the Future, and most recently, 2019, The Knowledge Economy. Roberto Unger has also been actively engaged in shaping several alternative political movements in Latin America, and has also served as Minister of Long-Term Planning. It's a beautiful title, the Ministry of Long-Term Planning, in Brazil, under Lula and then Dilma Rousseff. Throughout his writings and his political career, there is an incessant search for possibilities of human emancipation through social action. Tonight, two discussants will be joining Professor Unger after his presentation. The first is Jason Jackson, Ford Career Development Assistant Professor in Political Economy and Urban Planning. Jason's research focuses on the relationship between states and markets, seeking to understand the historical circumstance and evolution of the institutional arrangements through which states and markets are constituted, working historically from the 19th century to the present. Empirically, his work focuses on contexts ranging from the politics of monopoly and foreign investment in places like India to the sharing economy and urban transportation markets in contemporary cities in Asia, Europe, and in the United States. Jason is also a member of the task force on work of the future at MIT. The second discussion tonight is yours truly, architect, scholar, and student of Roberto Ungers. 25 years ago, as I was reviewing a chapter from my dissertation with Roberto, and actually it was a chapter on Kevin Lynch, which was published later on in Adrindam's book, Roberto asked me how the connection I was uncovering between Lynch's urban theory and the civil rights movement helped me advance my proposition for re-engaging democracy in uh, re-engaging design in contemporary democracies. When I tried to avoid the question, by saying that I needed to go back to the archives, Roberto pressed even further. He said, the facts of history will always remain underdetermined, so you might as well make your intentions clear. This was 
one of the most disorienting, challenging, but ultimately liberating pieces of advice I have ever heard. And I've shared it since with my own students. For one, I had been taught by the historians to curb my architectural imagination when reading archives. But then as I worked through it, I realized that foregrounding intention did not mean abandoning veracity, but rather it led to elevating history into a search for possibility. The historical figures I also learned were acting in uncertainty as well, but they were acting nevertheless. It was through Unger that I understood the role of the imagination in face of uncertainty, and through that, the work of the poet John Keats. Let us face it, it's not always the case that you learn about poetry from your law professor. For that alone, well, at least for that, please join me in welcoming to MIT and to our intellectual commons, the poet of our infinite possibilities, Roberto Mangabera Unger. Imagination in Power. In 1968, a nearly revolutionary moment during a period of reaction, these mysterious words appeared on walls all over the world as if they had been written by an angel. My contemporaries grew up and cast aside the dreams on which they had lavished the devotions of youth. I took those words to heart and tried to make sense of them in the course of a life. Encouraged by other words of the poet and prophet William Blake, if the fool would persist in his folly, he would become wise. Uh, in these moments, I address first the, the imagination, and then I ask what it would mean for the imagination to come to power. In technology, the machine, in the economy, in politics, and in the organization of cities. And at the end, I address the unifying theme in all this manifestations of the power of the imagination and speak to the struggle that lies before us. The imagination. The two defining moves of the imagination are first, that it distance itself from the phenomenon, and second, that it subsumes the phenomenon, the reality before us, under a range of variation. To understand something imaginatively is to grasp what it can become. And all the social sciences now are tainted in one way or another by mystification, because each in its different way has severed this vital link between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible. The mind has two sides. In one side, the mind is like a machine. It is modular and formulaic. But in another side, the mind is an anti-machine. It is not modular. It is not formulaic. It has the power to combine everything with everything else that we call recursive infinity. And above all, it has the power to transgress and defy its own settled methods and presuppositions, to discover something and to make sense of it afterward. 
what the poet called negative capability. This second side of the mind is the imagination. Nothing in the physical constitution of the brain determines the relative power of these two sides of the mind. Their relative power is shaped by the organization of society and of culture. And in this sense, the history of politics is internal to the history of the mind. The machine. Everything that we have learned how to repeat, we can express in a formula or an algorithm. And everything that we can express algorithmically or formulaically, we can embody in a physical contraption, the machine. The machine depends on the formula. Even when it appears to go directly from data to result, the rule of inference remains latent, implicit. The point of the machine is to do for us what we have learned how to repeat, so that we can reserve our supreme and, in a sense, our only resource, our time, for the not yet repeatable. In Henry Ford's assembly line or in Adam Smith's pin factory, the worker worked as if he were one of his machines. But the point of the machine is to do for us what we have learned how to repeat so that we can devote ourselves only to the not yet repeatable. And then the combination of the machine and the anti-machine, the human being, will be immensely more powerful than either of them alone. This revolutionary transformation in the relation of the person to the machine cannot take place in society as a whole so long as economically dependent wage labor remains the predominant form of free work. The higher forms of free work, self-employment and cooperation, must come to prevail, and they can prevail only if they are reconciled with the imperative of economies of scale, and they can be reconciled with those imperatives only if we innovate in the legal and institutional forms of property, of decentralized access to the resources and opportunities of production. The economy. In every historical circumstance, there exists a most advanced practice of production. Previously, it was industrial mass production. Now it is what we call the knowledge economy. The two greatest economists in the history of economics, Adam Smith and Karl Marx, understood that the best way to study the workings of the economy and its transformative possibilities is to study the most advanced practice of production. The most advanced practice of production is the most mindful practice. Therefore, the practice that is closest to the imagination and that by being closest to the imagination most fully reveals our powers. The knowledge economy today is not just a bunch of gadgets. It's not just high-tech industry or advanced manufacture. It exists in every part of production, but in every part of production it exists only as a fringe that excludes the vast majority of businesses and of workers. And this insular character of the new vanguardism then becomes a motor of both economic stagnation and economic inequality. How could there not be a slowdown in the rise of productivity if the most advanced practice is denied to the vast majority of businesses and of people? And how could there not be increasing inequality if there is a deepening chasm between the advanced and backward parts of production? The attempt to attenuate this inequality after the fact is incapable of mastering it through progressive taxation or redistributive social spending. 
it would be necessary to deepen the knowledge economy, to liberate its revolutionary potential, and to disseminate it. But to that end, we would need to reinvent the legal and institutional architecture of the market order. Democracy. From the standpoint of the imagination and its rise to power, democracy should be the perpetual creation of the new. All the democracies that exist in the world today are weak democracies. All of them perpetuate the rule of the living by the dead and continue to make change depend on crisis, especially in the form of economic ruin or military conflict. What we want is a high energy democracy that overthrows the rule of the living by the dead and diminishes the dependence of change on crisis. A high energy democracy is a democracy that raises the temperature of politics, the level of organized popular engagement in political life, that hastens the tempo of politics through the rapid resolution of impasse, and that combines a facility for decisive central initiative with the possibility of radical devolution so that parts of a country can secede from the dominant solutions and create counter models of the national future. In the high energy democracy, the imagination is organized as a form of political life. The city. Now I must take a step back. In this transformation of our social experience that would allow the imagination to take power, it is vital that the individual be secure in a haven of protected safeguards and capability ensuring endowments that he be unafraid and capable, like the seraph Abdiel in Paradise Lost, unseduced, unshaken, unterrified. But the reason for which we make him secure in this haven is so that a storm of experimentation can rage all around him, so that he can go out in the world and raise this storm. In the conventional discourse of fundamental rights, we have the part about the haven, but where is the part about the storm? The storm has to be organized in this alternative form of economic and political life. And then if there is this storm against the background of the haven, a third element becomes necessary. And the third element is that the practical basis of social cohesion, of social solidarity, can no longer be as it is under social liberalism and social democracy, money transfers organized by the state against the background of ethnic and cultural homogeneity. The only practical basis of social cohesion that is compatible with democracy and with the rule of the imagination is the multiplication of forms of collective action. What then do we want from the city so that it help us combine these three elements, the haven, the storm, and the connection among people? The city ha must have many places of withdrawal, of recess, of secrecy, of intimacy, of difference, hidden gardens and courtyards, and distinct neighborhoods, but free from any narrow path dependent vocabulary of folklore, free from the legacy of history, a broader range. The most important differences are not the differences that we have inherited, but the ones that we invent. But the city must then also be the basis for this storm, for this connection free from the narrow repertory of a high-handed and authoritarian modernism, 
and its narrow vocabulary of monumental spaces and structures. That's the latent logic of the city. That's its secret alliance with the cause of the imagination. We should want to say of the city what one American philosopher, Santayana, said of another, William James, that he was so extremely natural that there was no way of knowing what his nature was or what came next, that it be capable of giving surprise. Now, there is an idea that unifies all these expressions of the coming to power of the imagination. It's an idea about ourselves. The idea is that we are shaped by context, by a particular social and cultural world, but that there is always more in us, in each of us individually and in all of us collectively, the human race than there is or ever can be in these contexts. They are finite in relation to us, and we are infinite in relation to them. We become more human by becoming more godlike, by affirming this attribute of transcendence, and by reorganizing our societies and cultures, and even our physical space, so that they recognize and nurture this widening of our quota in the divine attribute of transcendence. And our reward is then to come more fully into the possession of life. Life in the only moment that we ever have, which is right now. Now, this idea about ourselves has implications both for how we live and for how we relate to our historical circumstance. As each of us grows older, a carapace of routine and compromise and resignation begins to form around each of us, a mummy, within which we begin to die many small deaths. Our interest is to break out of this mummy at the cost of a heightened vulnerability, and to live in such a way that we can die only once. And this idea, at the same time, has implications for our relation to our historical circumstance. We are living, our lives have fallen, in a counter-revolutionary interlude, in a long revolutionary period in the history of humanity that has gone on for the last two or 300 years. This revolutionary project has two sides. One side is political and has been carried by the doctrines of liberalism, socialism, and democracy. The other side is personalist, and it has been sustained by the Romantic movement and today by the worldwide popular Romantic culture with its message to every ordinary man and woman that he or she is not so ordinary after all, and is capable of this ascent to a higher and more godlike form of life. Uh, uh, we must not allow our biases, our actions, and our thoughts to be shaped by the biases of this counter-revolutionary interlude. And it is that determination, then, that underlies all of my previous remarks. This revolutionary project remains the strongest project in the world. It has enemies, but all of its enemies respond to it. But although it is still the strongest project in the world, it is also, in another sense, now weak. It is weak because its votaries no longer know what its next steps should be on either the political or the personalist side. The law of the spirit is that we can keep 
only what we are able to renounce and to reinvent. For this revolution to continue, we have to reinvent it in both its form and its content. In this struggle, we have an indispensable ally in the imagination, which comes into our mental experience carrying the torch of life and announcing the new and the possible. For the imagination to come to power, however, it must first save us. Imagination, imagination to the rescue. the right, so that's why we're sitting like this. Yes. Jason has kindly agreed to be the first to respond. <laughs> and you must know how difficult that would be. No pressure. Um, so I'm going to use my laptop because I have some notes here. So first, I just want to thank um, uh, very much uh, uh, Hasha for the invitation to, to join, uh, and especially to Professor Unger um, for the opportunity to respond to his work. So I remember when I first came across, so I'm going to open for my notes, when I first came across Professor Unger's uh, work, uh, it was maybe 2004. It was a very, very cold time just like this. I was living in Barbados at the time. Um, and I came to visit the US in February, March. Not a good idea. Uh, and I remember being hunkered down um, uh, inside trying to stay warm. And I was staying with um, someone who had uh, Roberto Unger's um, uh, book, uh, which I remember seeing and thinking to myself, this is one of the most incredible things I've come across. So this was democracy realized. Um, and so I was just remarking um, uh, yesterday to my partner that, oh, 15 years later, I sort of coming across the book then, I have the opportunity to respond directly to some of his work. So thank you very much. Um, so uh, I thought I would pick up on um, the sort of key, one of the key strands, I think, um, of Professor Unger's um, presentation around the knowledge economy uh, by saying something about platforms. Um, and so, uh, so platforms, of course, as Professor Unger has, has noted, um, are one of the key sites uh, of sort of contemporary structural transformations uh, in the global economy. Um, and they raise a couple of issues um, that are really key, I think, for us to, to think about in light of Professor Unger's work. Um, so I'll just try to highlight um, a few sort of schematically um, and then close um, with the, the following on the invitation um, from Professor Unger uh, to think about the mind uh, and imagination. Um, so one of the things, uh, two things that the platform economy allows us to think about um, are, on one hand, the evolving state firm relationship um, and the role of platforms um, in reordering that relationship, especially if we think about the old um, state firm relationship, um, whether it be under um, Fordist um, capitalism, industrial capitalism uh, in the global north, um, or through uh, the developmental state or attempts at developmental states uh, in the global south. Um, and we can think about these transformations uh, with platforms, um, I would suggest, for today, in, in two arenas and two levels. Uh, the two arenas could be labor and finance, um, and the two levels, uh, the municipal level, um, not, the st not the national level so much, with platforms, uh, primarily because cities um, have emerged as the key sites of accumulation, regulation, and struggle uh, in the context of platforms, um, as well as the global. So we have a global and a city, and it raises questions uh, about the role of uh, the national. Uh, so with respect to the sort of transformation that I, I believe we're seeing with platforms, um, and some of this is outlined in uh, Professor Ongo's most recent book, um, The Knowledge Economy from Verso, uh, the old model rested on ideas um, and practices of capital, uh, excuse me, capitalist consolidation and redistribution um, uh, in the United States um, through the New Deal social contract, um, in Europe through welfare states, um, but overall through, again, this sort of Fordist um, mode um, of social uh, and political economic organization. Um, while by contrast, uh, in the Global South, uh, firms were constituted very much in terms of um, family-owned uh, um, diversified business groups um, organized under a developmental state. And so the logics of work, the logics of distribution, um, the logics of production, the logics of economic growth really rested on these contrasting uh, models um, of different relationships between firms um, and the state. Uh, 
what we've seen um, over the course of the last uh, three or four decades, uh, beginning perhaps in the late 1970s, uh, early 1980s, um, with this period that we refer to as neoliberalism, um, is a transformation of this model. Uh, in the United States and Europe, a vertical disintegration of the, the Fordist firm, uh, so processes of Nikeification, um, so the fragmentation of global production um, through global value chains um, that relies on low-wage labor, um, primarily in the global south, um, weak tax regimes, um, liberalized trade, uh, liberalized technology flows, but of course not liberalized uh, labor flows, um, and continuations in stratification and exclusion globally along race and gender lines. In the global south, we see informal markets really coming to the fore, and rural urban migrations becoming centrally important, often prompted by changes in rural land ownership patterns, um, so various forms of exclusion and expulsion uh, from rural areas. Um, as well as cross-border migrations, many of which are informal or illegal. Uh, with the rise, however, of uh, the platform firms uh, and the platform uh, business model, really I would suggest takes advantage of these kinds of transformations uh, in key ways. Um, certainly in both the global north and the global south, um, a new labor force has become uh, available that no longer falls under the kinds of uh, uh, institutional logics as well as moral logics um, of the Fordist model uh, in the global north um, or the, the model of the developmental states um, in the global south, a kind of model of inclusion in a formal uh, economy. Uh, instead, we get a, a fragmentation that provides a, produces excuse me, a, a workforce um, that's a ready um, available um, wage force um, uh, for, for platform work, um, for this new mode of fragmentation, this new form of governance um, under platforms. Uh, but whereas the old model relied um, significantly uh, uh, on a national model um, and trade between nations, um, financial flows between nations, um, the platform model, uh, even though it's manifesting crucially um, in the city sites, um, as I noted at the beginning, uh, also rests crucially on global flows. Um, and global capital flows are central to this. Uh, so the platform model relies, uh, in most instances, um, for example, in, in ride hailing, um, in housing, so think of Uber in the ride hailing context, uh, Airbnb in the housing context, uh, but also in other areas of the platform economy as well. Uh, on a business model um, of global capital flows um, that rely on surplus uh, finance, um, cheap finance in a post-2008 context um, that allows for um, significant subsidization of, um, uh, uh, of the kinds of services um, that workers provide. So workers are squeezed on one hand um, in providing uh, platform work, um, but the price that consumers um, or users um, of platforms uh, pay are significantly subsidized um, by this global um, uh, mobile uh, surplus capital. These forms of venture capital, um, both from uh, familiar sites such as Silicon Valley, um, and more recently, more importantly, um, alternative sites um, such as those raised to firms like SoftBank, for example, out of Japan, um, often uh, with significant um, financing um, from sovereign wealth funds. Uh, the Saudis, of course, are, are probably the most interesting and important um, in this regard. So this is a sort of way in which we've seen this big global uh, structural uh, transformation in the, the global economy um, resting on platforms, but they raise a number of really important questions for us to consider, again, I think, in light of Professor Unger's work. So to the extent that the machine, uh, to borrow from Professor Unger's language, has been transformed from the old industrial model, both the actual physical machine, as Professor Unger described, as well as the broader social institutional machine, um, to a new form, what are the kinds of entry points um, and what kinds of conflicts uh, are engendered uh, in the platform model? So for example, when we think of the way the platform model is imagined, um, and more specifically markets are imagined, we might ask questions such as, how do platform designers, engineers oftentimes, um, much as the ones that we produce uh, here at, at MIT, um, how do platform designers imagine or see, to borrow Jim Scott's um, famous term, uh, the market? Uh, and crucially, how do they then attempt to algorithmically design markets reflecting this kind of shared imagination? Um, for example, we may think about this in the context of urban mobility markets. Uh, and in turn, how do platform participants similarly imagine or see the market? So think of workers, ride-hailing drivers, Deliveroo uh, drivers, for example, Instacart workers. How do they imagine the market? How do they imagine the sort of spaces that they're willing to enter, that they're not willing to enter, the kinds of prices um, that they're willing to accept and not willing to accept? And how do they attempt to engage strategically um, with the platform in dynamic ways? So we can think of a dynamic interchange between platform designers on one hand and platform participants uh, on the other. 
um, a space essentially where the different imaginations or the different ways in which um, designers and participants um, see uh, and experience the market collide. And so this is another way, um, I believe, of thinking about the kinds of, of struggles that, that emerge uh, in the platform context. Um, and they raise important questions for, questions for us as well, such as how do we reimagine this particular kind of manifestation of the knowledge economy, where we conceptualize it through this um, colliding um, or the struggle or, or this clash uh, between different imaginations um, of the platform uh, economy. Uh, and in turn, what kind of institutional architecture might this result in? Not the one that we have now, based, as I mentioned, um, on uh, uh, surplus finance on one hand, as well as surplus labor, um, but one that reflects uh, the kinds of uh, moral groundings, sort of moral um, uh, demands uh, that are being made um, by platform participants, um, by those who are on one hand seen as uh, uh, sort of available labor to allow the platform to work, uh, but ultimately um, reflect the sort of broader core um, of our civil society. Thanks. My turn. Oh. Sure. My encounter with Roberto's work predates Jason's by about 15 years. <laughs> That's not because I'm 15 years older. Well, much more. <laughs> but uh, it had to do with an attraction to two ideas that he put in front of us as students at, back then. One was the fact that the central questions of politics in a social democracy have left politics, and that they now reside in the professional discourses, frozen though be it, of law, medicine, environment, and architecture, and that it is our task as professionals like architects to unfreeze them, to defrost them, and unpack and expose how our agency could politicize and reveal under every stone in architecture, for example, a political content, and how we mobilize it so that we can bring back the political questions into action, and that we become free, change, free agents of change, of political change. The second attraction is very much the question of the role of the imagination, that throughout his teaching, throughout his books, uh, there is this kind of persistent, uh, incessant energy for the imagination to take precedent over understanding. I say that with a lot of controversy among scientists and technicians at MIT, but uh, the idea that we can act ahead of certainty is a very important dimension of what I've learned, uh, particularly that I also learned it to be very much the definition of scientific method, being able to act ahead of full evidence. And the indelible role of the imagination in making that leap and the construction of veracity there. But I do want to bring both questions back home and 30 years later, as it were, uh, propose perhaps a couple of inversions to the discussion that you gave us today. The first inver inversion has to do with the place of the imagination in the economy and to give it much more primacy. Much, much, much more primacy. I am still a deep believer in that project of the imagination. Even so more now than ever before. About three years ago at a faculty meeting at MIT, the team that you belong to, the uh, task force on the future of work, uh, proposed in a very simple diagram two curves. It's a well-known diagram of two curves bifurcating with time. One is that of labor, the other one is of capital, arguing that with the advent of the digital economy, labor and capital have separated from each other. And that may have to do with the digitization of work, therefore the labor force being weakened. Since then, I've discussed this double curve with other economists, but. Uh, who have argued that there were many other reasons for this bifurcation, the digital economy being just one of them. But that space, your colleagues in the task force have argued, that space that has been exposed between labor and capital is a space that could be taken over by creative economy, by creativity and the imagination, arguing that it will be a long, long while before the computer can produce creatively. Many in this room are working hard to make the computer pr produce creatively and to prove us, other, prove us wrong. 
But that binary opposition that you have created between the machine and the anti-machine, and the space that the digital or the knowledge economy is producing in order to allow us to spend more time thinking creatively, I would propose that it would be accelerated even more. And accelerated more by virtue of exposing within the scientific method, within the working of the machine, the inextractable creative dimension. I say that also because I feel that we are unable to wait for creativity to enter into the scientific thinking and to the technological thinking in uh, both a stealth way and a direct way. Uh, we have dismissed it for far too long. We have put aside the question of what if far too long, and that the fixation, whether in technology or economics, on problem solving rather than alternative creativity is, uh, is something we cannot wait for anymore. This is what we as architects, as artists, as designers, and to a great extent as planners do best. Engineers, scientists, social scientists, economists like to solve problems. We do not need to start with problems. We can start with solutions or alternative solutions. I'm looking for a way to put that first, thus the proposal for an inversion. How to do that is very difficult, but it does require a change of mindset, a change of epistemology in the economics and social sciences. The second inversion I would like to propose is that in the order of things of your title of putting economy ahead of democracy and ahead of the city. In trying to articulate a position about where these emancipatory economic models can happen, you've very lucidly presented us with democracy as being this political frameworks in which they happen. But in trying to help us think through what forms, what networks, what associations democracy lays out, you propose the city. Aristotle before you has tried to do that. And in trying to articulate what the best politics are, he could not imagine them outside the city. He said, for safety, people came together, but they stayed for dignity, for creativity, and for pleasure. What I would like to propose is this inversion, that maybe we can start by thinking first about the spaces around which we come together, imagining those prior to imagining the democracy and the economy. For one, they are more palpable. We can feel them. We can hold each other. We can work with each other. For another, they are more urgent. But for another, I feel like since Aristotle, we have been trying to imagine economics and democracy outside of space, but we have failed. Why is it that we delegate to space the role of simply illustrating and realizing our political ideas when in space and its shaping, whether at the scale of city, at the scale of country, or even at the scale of this encounter, we are able to rehearse, practice, change, reorganize without the burden of law, without the burden of policy, without the burden of institutional forming, and use that as the model and exercise to imagine how we can live together, how we can exchange together, rather than start with the other way around. In both cases, I'm advocating, I'm imploring for giving the imagination even more primacy. That's it. Very good. So would you like me to speak now to Please. say something in response? Please. So, um, let me return to the central theme of my remarks and try and relate that theme to what both of you have said. So the central theme is the access of imagination and transcendence. We're not what we seem to be. We exceed. We spill over. This is our, our, our faculty of being, being greater than the circumstance and being able to turn the tables on the context. And our freedom, uh, our rising together to a higher form of life, depends on the development of this faculty and on its expression 
in each area of social practice. So everywhere we turn in our experience, we find that the potential is robbed from us, that the form that prevails is the perversion of a possibility. So the discussion of the knowledge economy. I do not equate the knowledge economy with the platform companies. I think that the platform companies are a little corner of the knowledge economy. <clears throat> corner with certain characteristics. So they have the network effects. The oligopolies benefit from their ability to have an advantage over smaller firms with high fixed costs. Uh, they have zero marginal cost to extend the platforms. And what is especially interesting for a jurist is that they actually depend on a loophole in the law of intellectual property, which is that they traffic in data for which they don't pay. <laughs> and the transformation of that legal detail would all by itself destroy their business model. So they have these rents, uh, but they're not uh, what the, their theoreticians, their ideologists claim, which is the road to explosive economic growth through increasing returns to scale. They're a source of oligopolistic rents. That's just a corner of the knowledge economy with its own special perversions. But there is a general perversion. The general perversion is that instead of deepening and spreading, and deepening and spreading are two sides of the same thing, the knowledge economy is quarantined in these fringes, in these islands. And it is becoming more insular rather than less. The masters of the knowledge economy are discovering a way to bifurcate the process of production into two parts. The creative part that they keep for themselves and the part that they can turn into commodities or routines that they then subcontract to firms and workers in parts of the world where the tax take is lower and the returns to labor are lower. So, uh, in that circumstance of the immiseration and radical insecurity of labor, there is an, a, a setting that inhibits any dynamic of uh, an inclusive rise of productivity. So we have this vast potential of a form of production which brings together the best firms and the best schools, which makes production resemble imagination and it's taken away from us by this set of perversions. Now, these perversions are examples of a recurrent phenomenon in history, which is that when there is an innovation, the innovation tends to be established in the form that least disturbs the ruling interests and the established preconceptions. That's what you could call the path of least resistance. But the path of least resistance has the advantage of being more tangible, of involving less break with the dominant interest, but the disadvantage that it fails to exploit the potential of the innovations to the full extent. And that's the opportunity then for its enemies. The path of least resistance is always the most probable outcome, but it's never the necessary outcome. And so, an inclusive form of the knowledge economy would require the reinvention of the educational and legal institutional background of the market order. And a conflict, a struggle in society over the direction. Now, look at the United States. Uh, where's the, the, where, the, the progressives in the United States, and indeed in Europe generally, have no productivist project. What's their project? Their project is the project of the, uh, is the humanization of the project of their conservative adversaries. They, instead of reshaping the worlds of power and production, uh, they want to do this retrospective correction through progressive taxation and social entitlement. It's a losing proposition because in this political struggle, uh, 
whichever force most credibly embodies the cause of energy, of innovation, of construction, commands the agenda. And if the position of the progressives is pietistic rather than transformative, they've lost before the conflict has even begun. So that's the, that's the perversion in the economy. Now let's talk about another area to give an example of what prevents the rise of the imagination, education. So I didn't mention that, but that's another sphere. And let's give, a, again, the example of the United States. So uh, there are two educational systems in the United States, it's a, a radical educational dualism. At the top, the uh, elite private schools and the top tier of public schools have adopted a truncated version of John Dewey's program. So they've accepted from Dewey's program the part about uh, the primacy of analytical capabilities achieved through dialogue, through discussion. But they've rejected the critical part of Dewey's program. And they replace that by the focus on the, on the mastery of a certain form of sociability, <laughs> which is regarded as useful to incorporation into the American professional and business class. So they teach people to be masters of a style of cheerful and personal friendliness uh, and a form of charisma, uh, of self-depreciating charisma in which you seduce the others in the group, but at the same time you conceal the seduction. And it's a very particular style, which is part of the operations of this class, but a complete perversion of Dewey's program. Then there's the second part of the American system, which is uh, this babysitting operation. It's a kind of industrial discipline for a world that no longer exists, a Fordist mass production factories in which workers didn't have to know anything. They just needed to have elementary literacy and numeracy and a disposition to obedience and basic physical dexterity. So we want a completely different kind of education. It's has not just privilege and analytic and synthetic capabilities of the imagination over mastery of data, of information, but with respect to information, prefer selective deepening to encyclopedic superficiality. In the classroom, cooperation among students, teachers, and schools, rather than the juxtaposition of authoritarianism and individualism. And now comes the most important part. It has to be dialectical. Every subject has to be taught at least twice from contrasting points of view. So that's a program, a project of national liberation. So what is the university like? The, the, the orthodoxies of the university culture are organized on the basis of forced marriage between method and subject matter. So for example, economics is not the study of the economy. Economics is a study of a method pioneered by the marginalist theoreticians at the end of the 19th century. And the study of the economy by other, any other method is not regarded as economics. The life sciences are taught by a historical method. Fundamental physics is studied by an anti-historical method. That happened because the now dominant paradigms of quantum mechanics and relativity emerged just before the discovery in the 1920s of the historical character of the universe. If the universe has a history, every part of it must be historical. And then the method of fundamental physics must also be historical. Now, the national curriculums that exist in the world infantilize these orthodoxies of the university culture. They project these orthodoxies back to the education of the young and induce them to mistake the dominant ideas for the way things are. So they emasculate themselves and deliver them emasculated to the higher stages of education prepared for a life of intellectual servility. And what we want is a form of basic education that is more profound than the superficial university education, and that immunizes the young against the orthodoxies that will be presented to them. 
So that's another example of a practice. So what I'm saying is that if systematically you examine each area of social practice, you discover a different terrain of conflict, but that the fundamental themes remain the same. It's a chain of analogies. If we want to be free, we have to attack on all these fronts. Uh, and that then is the coming of the imagination to power. That's the basic message of my remarks. <laughs> I have one more question, and I, yes. I know that I'm taking yes. away from their uh, possibility of asking questions, but it has to do with the project of the imagination as being, in your remarks today, still an individual project, and how to make it a collective project. It is a collective project also. It's both an individual project and a collective project. But this is a very important problem to understand philosophically. So I said there's this revolutionary project, two, two or 300 years in which the world has been set on fire. That's a collective project. And it's a project that takes place in historical, not in biographical time. Now, St. Augustine says all ages are equidistant from eternity. <laughs> but the problem is that we don't live in historical time. We live in biographical time. We don't get to choose our, 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 our place in history. So there's a collective project. That's what we're talking about, the, re the reformation of the economic order, of education, of politics, and so forth. But that takes place on, in a time dimension beyond the scope of our lifetimes. We'll be dead uh, before that happens. So, we also have to have a moral project, a, a way of living, that makes up in some way for the defects, for the failures of these collective projects. And it's necessary then to have a, a, a view. And the views that are available to us, like radical altruism or romanticism, are inadequate. They're primitive. Uh, and there, too, we have to formulate a view of the conduct of life. Uh, so my little reference to the mummy and breaking the mummy was an allusion or an example to that kind of discourse. How are we to live, given that we don't control the tempo of the collective project, so that we can be free? And, and uh, while we're living, uh, and, not, uh, uh, and not just the instruments of this collective project whose, whose progression we don't command. I would like to, maybe over dinner, defend still the romantic project. But uh, I, in the interest of time, I just wanted to ask you if you had any more remarks, or should we open uh, it to I the can't, public? But I can't resist responding to your comment on romanticism. <laughs> because, because, look. The, 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 the romantic movement is one of the sides of this revolution that I described. And it, it, is, uh, it, it has carried forward the message of the Semitic monotheisms of Christianity, the message of infinity. So the uh, idea of the, 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 the core of the romantic idea, which continues the message of Christianity, is that we are the infinite within the finite, first, and that second, that love is higher than altruism. The organizing principle of the moral life is not altruism, it is love. And there's an intimate relation between these two themes. Now, but romanticism has a defect, a flaw, which we have to understand. So the, the romantic idea is that we are only fully human in those interludes in which we shake the dominion of the structures. So romantic love against the routines of married life, or the mob in the streets, the people in the streets against the bureaucratic apparatus. The structures will always come back on this romantic view, but we can be free and truly human in those moments, in those ephemeral circumstances, 
in which we lift the hand of the structure before this hand of Midas comes back and kills the spirit. So in the romantic novel, the whole struggle is to win the beloved, but the marriage is never represented because it's literally unimaginable for the romantic. Huh? So this is a form of despair in which the romantic despairs of changing the relation between structure and spirit. Now, in all of these remarks of mine, I'm suggesting a, a kind of structure in education, in politics, in the economy that is more hospitable to spirit and allows us to be insiders and outsiders at the same time, to engage without surrendering. Because if we have to choose between engagement and, and uh, in, engagement with surrender or uh, freedom with isolation, we're not free. Uh, so this is a criticism of romanticism. And it's, 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 it's an evolution in which romanticism has a pedagogic message. It's part of our enlightenment, our emancipation. But then we criticize it and go beyond it mm -hmm. to a deeper view. And, and this is what we have to do with all aspects of the revolutionary project of the West. So it is not enough to humanize society the progressive ideas to divinize humanity. We ascend to a higher form of life, and we can only ascend by ascending together. And then we need a systematic criticism of everything. When we attempt to do the systematic criticism of everything, we discover that the established social sciences and policy discourse are more part of the problem than they're part of the solution. They are dominated in the positive social sciences by what in the history of philosophy we would call right-wing Hegelianism, the real is rational. The normative disciplines of political philosophy and legal theory are uh, appeal to pseudo-philosophical props to the humanizing practices, humanizing the order rather than changing it. And the humanities embark on a roller coaster of subjectivist adventurism, disconnected from the remaking and reimagination of society. So we have in the positive social sciences and the hard sciences, rationalization in the normative disciplines, humanization, and in the humanities, escapism. And the, the uh, practitioners of these three tendencies claim to be opponents, but they are, in fact, allies in the disarmament of the transformative will and imagination. So the, we, we have to resist, in, in, in this critical and transformative struggle, we have to wage war in all of the disciplines, in all the established forms of culture. Uh, and, uh, but we wage war step by step, front by front, uh, until everything has been thrown open. I hold on to my new romanticism and that's not the Boy George romanticism, yeah. in two ways. One is that it highlights and prioritizes the aesthetic and aesthetic experience in a way that no other position towards the future does. And the other is that despite the fact that it holds on to the nation state as being the model of the collective imaginary and the pursuit of that in that historical moment of the late 18th, early 19th century, there is still an attempt by the romantics to connect between the individual imagination and the collective, and that that becomes part and parcel of the romantic project. That's... So don't, don't expect from me any uh, uh, overall opposition to romanticism. I'm, I'm constantly denounced as a romantic. So, <laughs> but I, I'm, I'm trying to distance myself just partially. I, uh, I, 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 we want you back. <laughs> so can I jump in? I've never one? left. <laughs> <laughs> so can I pose just one question, just to, to sort of add yeah. on to this, maybe from the other side, which is, what role does uh, how does how do you, how does conflict emerge, or to what extent does conflict emerge, um, in on one hand this attempt for institutional restructuring, um, imagining a new kind of social and institutional order, um, even given the sort of uh, confines of uh, rationalization, humanization, and escapism that we deal with in a, uh, certainly in the current 
spaces where ideas are yeah. produced, the academy. So there are always, so one way to approach this question is by contrasting it with the Marxist idea of conflict. So in Marx's idea, there's an objective logic of class interests, and that determines the course of conflict. And the more, the deeper and more acute and wider the conflict, the more transparent the content of the class interest becomes. The truth is just the opposite. That the, uh, the, the impression that there are self-evident class interests depends on the restraint on conflict. Because the more extensive conflict is, the harder it becomes to distinguish the question, what are my interests as a member of a certain group, from the question, what are the alternatives in the adjacent possible? Who would I be in that adjacent possible, and what would my interests then become? So any, there are always two families of ways of defining and defending a group interest. There's one way which is institutionally conservative and socially exclusive. So for example, take the core constituency of the left parties in modern Western history. The industrial proletariat headquartered in mass production industry in the capital intensive sectors of the economy. So now mass production is declining, like the Rust Belt in the United States. The right-wing populists and the American social democrats or progressives have no industrial project. Their project is to buy a few more years for declining mass production <laughs> industry. They have no project to convert it into the knowledge economy. And so the, then the I idea is the interests of this group of workers in the Rust Belt industries depend on building into this niche and defending it against all comers. So the enemies are the groups that are most closest to them in social space, the small business class, the temporary workers, the foreign workers to whom the jobs are subcontracted, and so forth. There's always another way of defining and defending a group interest, which is institutionally transformative and socially solidaristic. So then you say, this project has no future. We're not going to save mass production industry. We're, at the most, we're going to give it another 10 years. So we have to change it into something else. Changing into something else requires innovation in the legal and institutional arrangements of the market order. And it requires us to understand that those groups that we thought of as our rivals or enemies have to become our allies, the small business class, the temporary workers, and so forth. So this ambiguity in the way of defining and defending a group interest between these two sets of ways is then an invitation to understand conflict in fundamentally different directions and, and in a completely anti-Marxist fashion, which is much more transformative and dispenses with a historical fatalism. You know, I'm a, I'm a Brazilian, and in my country, as in most of the world, the intelligentsia is now divided into two main factions. One faction is a fossilized, shrunken Marxism. So it's taken from the zeitgeist, a little axe. It's cut Marxism in half. It's thrown out the good part, which are the transformative aspirations. And it's kept the bad part, which is the historical fatalism. <laughs> and the other main current of the intelligentsia is the carbon copy of the American social sciences, like economics, as an, a, a kind of apologetics of this management of the present order the rationalization. And they, are, they say they're enemies. But they're not enemies. They're, two, they're the two sides of the chorus of fate, which we have to defeat in this intellectual struggle all over the world. They're allies, the shrunken Marxist and the colonial representatives of American-style social science, uh, so that we can reestablish the vital link between insight into the actual and imagination of the adjacent possible. Like Cassandra's, they turn their premonitions into visions. Uh, can we open up the Absolutely. questions to the audience? Any questions? 
uh, not just questions, but propositions, challenges, and so forth. There's a mic over there and the mic over there, so please speak from the mics. Hi, Professor Unger. Yes. On? Not yet. Are you no. hearing me? Okay, great. Um, I'm curious to know, you know, I, I have feet of clay sometimes in thinking about these things, uh, and you mentioned a couple things in here where I'm looking for kind of close approximations of the social forms that you imagine. So in particular, you mentioned these spaces of, you know, re reclusion within cities, and I'm curious to know if there are close approximations of that in the world today. And similarly with the kind of Dewey and education model that you talked about. Are there uh, if there are close approximations to what? To the ideal type that you're talking about. Well, it's, I don't think it's an ideal type. So, so my point was the, the city as it has developed, in fact, in history, uh, has latent these two elements. But they're both constrained. So the element of what I call the haven the secrecy, the intimacy, the difference, the withdrawal exists. But it exists under the constraint of path dependency. So it's the folklore or the history of each society and each city. Now, what do we want as progressives, as revolutionaries, is to affirm this principle of difference, of seclusion, of intimacy, of withdrawal, but to liberate it from the narrow repertory of the folklore, of the path-dependent trajectory. So it's not just the cultural differences that have been inherited, but ones that on the basis of this inheritance, we will invent. Now, the same applies to the other side, the storm, the combination. So it shouldn't be restricted to the monumental fetishes of public space of classic Western architecture. That should be just a subset of a much larger range of possibilities. So the idea is not that I'm, it's a message from Mars, like it's the city radically different from the cities that have actually evolved in history. It's rather that we understand that this is the vital connection. We want people to be secure in this haven, unafraid, like the Seraph Abdiel, but then we want there to be connection and storm outside. And we have to organize these two ideas in the, con in the evolution of the city, free from the narrow constraints of the path-dependent history. That's, that's the conception. And it's then against, so it's against the high-handed authoritarian modernism. And it's also against any kind of historicism or traditionalism. Thinking of anybody else want to jump in on the mic here? As well, Paul Elton. Um, well, I'm thinking of like the kind of projects around like real utopias too, though. You know, where it's kind of trying to, trying to vision like, is there a real world place in which this is possible today? And I'm curious to know if there's anything that strikes you as that real place today. Well, but I'm not thinking in this quote utopian way, mm -hmm. because I'm thinking that transformation uh, happens through deconstruction and reconstruction of the actual world. And that's much better and more promising than the jump into some imaginary world. So, and this also is connected to a basic dispute in social theory. Let me again formulate it in the polemic against Marxism. So, you know that in the world today, many countries are governed by disillusioned former Marxists who are now institutionally conservative social democrats. So the way they think is real change would be the revolutionary substitution of one system for another, capitalism by socialism. It's a binary idea of politics. There are two kinds of politics. There's the, the replacement of one mode of production by another, or the management of an existing mode of production, so-called reformism. Now, so they think. The revolutionary substitution is not in the cards. And if it were, it would be too dangerous. So what's left to do in the world is to humanize. And so in this perverse way, the idea of revolution has been converted into an alibi for its opposite. So because revolution is a fantasy, what's left to do is this humanization, this gain in marginal efficiencies and equities. We have to reject all of that. 
because there aren't these indivisible systems. And real structural change in the world is always fragmentary. So the idea of wholesale change is just like a limiting case, a fantastical limiting case. It's fragmentary. And nevertheless, it can become revolutionary in its outcome if it persists in a certain direction. And so uh, we have to associate this kind of transformative realism with structural ambition. And that leads us to change our attitudes about everything which is another way of restating the central message in these remarks. Thank you. You want to take the microphone, or you rather from there? Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Edgar, for sharing your perspective. Um, you've mentioned massive uh, the knowledge economy. So I was wondering if you could render this notion less abstract by giving it to example. Of the knowledge economy? Of the masses, of the knowledge economy. The, so, what, what are the, the margins. Uh, the, 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 the institutions or the actors that... So, 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 so yeah. I think there's some confusion about what the knowledge economy is and how I'm understanding it. And so to me, the knowledge economy is characterized by a, 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 a unique set of practices that distinguish it from industrial mass production. So at the superficial level, for example, that it combines customization or destandardization with production at scale. But it has certain deeper characteristics, which it fails to reveal fully because of its present confined form. So among its deeper characteristics, one of the most important is that it has the promise, the potential, of loosening or reversing what has been the most universal constraint in economic life, which is diminishing marginal returns. It's not increasing returns to scale. It's something else. Because it, there's the promise of organizing a form of innovation that is perpetual rather than punctuated or episodic. And to the extent that innovation becomes perpetual and endogenous to the production system, there's the promise of reversing this most constant and universal constraint in economic life. A law, if anything, in economic life is a law, which is diminishing marginal returns. So the, the knowledge economy today exists in every part of production in advanced manufacture, in intellectually dense services, and even in precision or scientific agriculture. And indeed, the distinction among sectors is being attenuated. For example, advanced manufacture consists largely in crystallized intellectual services. Nevertheless, although it is multi-sectoral, it exists in every part of production, in each sector, it is a tiny fringe denied to the vast majority. And so you have, in a, there's a discourse in the United States now that goes under the name of secular stagnation, which uh, a, a label from the 1930s from, uh, uh, from Alvin Hansen, which tries to give a mendacious semblance of naturalness and necessity to the slowdown in productivity. So for example, it claims that the technological innovations of today have much less transformative potential than the technological innovations of 100 years ago. This is absurd. What could have more revolutionary potential than artificial intelligence? There's a much more straightforward explanation of economic stagnation, which is that the most advanced practice is denied to the majority not just to the majority of workers, but to the vast majority of firms. So if the vanguard practice is available only to a small part of the economic agents, how could there not be slowdown? So, and, 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 and that then discussion is connected to the discussion of inequality. You want to overcome inequality? Then you have to innovate in the arrangements that shape the primary distribution 
of economic and educational advantage, not simply correct after the fact against the logic of the economic arrangements and incentives for the consequences of this hierarchical segmentation of the production system. So these are all things that you might regard as too obvious to mention. But in fact, they're antagonistic to the dominant ideas in policy and in economics itself. So this is, this is a grave situation in which the intelligentsia, the professors, the dominant ideas have become the disseminators of superstition and the enemies of freedom and prosperity. And so we, we, we have to wage war. Uh, and uh, in, in, in every discipline, in every field, about all of these ideas, what else can we do? This is the only way to carry forward the cause of emancipation and enlightenment. Um, so I guess the big elephant in the room uh, for me is whose imagination are we talking about? Undeniably, our world is um, shaped by the imaginations of management consultants, uh, venture capitalists, uh, multinational corporations. Uh, and the current administration from the perspective of architecture is drafting an executive order to limit all federal buildings to neoclassical styles. So we are living in the imaginations of, of certain kinds of people, groups of people. So, so my question is, how would you qualify the, the term imagination? Is creative and romantic were some uh, words uh, thrown out? And do you also uh, fear that the kind of imagination you've you're putting forward is shared by a small minority of people. No. So a Democrat has to believe that prophetic powers are widely diffused in the whole of humanity. And uh, that, so, but how does this become real? This becomes real through the transformation of each area of social practice. A different economy, a different politics, a different education, step by step, piece by piece. It's not all or nothing. But uh, it's, it's not as if there were, they, that this was a power confined to a narrow slice of humanity. And maybe there, there are many ways to approach this. So you know the Schopenhauer uh, makes this remark in, his, in, his, in the world as will and representation about the difference between a genius and a talented person. So he says, a talented person is a marksman who hits a target that others cannot hit. A genius is a marksman who hits a target that others cannot see. So it's common for intellectuals to think that they deserve to be geniuses because they're very smart. But, but genius is not a kind of super cleverness or facility. It's vision. And this power of vision is widely diffused in humanity and we can create the practical conditions to liberate it. Uh, and that's what we want. Uh, so, and so what's, what's the fundamental, how should we understand today the fundamental division between the right and the left? So the conventional view of the ideological controversy is the right are those who prioritize freedom against the established institutional background. The left are those who prioritize equality. So it's shallow freedom against shallow equality. That's not how we should think of it. We should say, who are, who are the progressives? Who are the left? Uh, and by contrast, who are the conservatives? There's a difference with respect to the structure and a difference with respect to the aim. So the conservatives think that littleness is natural, that there are few people who are bigger but most people are naturally small. And the progressives think that we can become bigger only together, or not at all, and we ascend together. And we become more human by becoming more godlike. We ascend to a form of life with greater scope, greater capability, greater intensity. We awaken from our slumbers instead of dying beforehand, as we generally do. That's the aim. And the struggle against inequality is subservient to that larger goal. So by that standard, the standard of the goal, the vast majority of contemporary progressives are conservatives. 
Now, then we come to the other distinction, which is the distinction of method. What distinguishes the left from the right? What distinguishes the left from the right is that the left doesn't accept the present structure, the institutional organization of politics and the economy, as the horizon within which to pursue our interests and ideals. So we insist on the primacy of structural change, although unlike the liberals and socialists of the 19th century, we are unwilling to succumb to a structural dogmatism. So we have an unprecedented problem, which is how to affirm the primacy of structural alternatives without surrendering to structural blueprints or dogmas. Uh, that has no historical precedent, that problem. The conservatives are all those who say there are no alternatives. The calamities of the 20th century have demonstrated the failure of all alternatives. This is it, and let's make the best of it. Let's humanize it, let's make it more efficient, and so forth. By that standard as well, the vast majority of progressives are conservatives. That's the relevant distinction between the right and the left. And, and of course, in these remarks today, I spoke from the standpoint of this left, of the left as I understand it, with respect to both the goal and the method. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you so much for your remarks. I've enjoyed hearing all three of you um, speak this evening. I'm, I'm especially moved by your indictment of the social sciences uh, as humanizing as opposed to remaking. And I it's actually the normative disciplines that are humanizing. Okay. The social sciences, for the most part, are rationalizing. Still bad. <laughs> <laughs> Still bad, yes. So, Mystification. So yes. given that indictment, I hoped you perhaps could speak a bit about what you see or whether you see any potential in leveraging the governmentality of evaluations to insert a logic of equity uh, towards more transformative change. In, in leveraging which? in leveraging the governmentality of evaluations, be it in the social sciences, be it in the social practice, particularly well, given think, the context well, in which I think we there's exist, a struggle which is very much be, run by evidence-based policy. You know, in each discipline, there's a struggle to be had. So it's not as if it were like the 19th century, that there's a central space of philosophy and social theory. So the the the... The, the most important terrain of conflict is now in the different fields, specialties, and disciplines. But it's like Tolstoy says at the beginning of Anna Karenina, each ha happy all happy families are alike, but each happy family is unhappy in its own way. So each of the social sciences is mystifying in its own way. So economics has a unique way of doing this, which is the, the defects of the economics that resulted from marginalism. Uh, in legal thought, there's this idealization of law in the vocabulary of impersonal policies and principles. So there's a, there's a contest to, 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 uh, uh, to wage in each of the disciplines. It's a different contest. But it still relates to, these, to this general agenda that we're discussing. So that's what's really difficult, right? Because now we, we, since the contest goes on in these specialties, we find that we have to be specialists or technicians and visionaries at the same time. Now that's a tall order. How can we be that? And, but, that's, but that's what's necessary uh, because it's no use speaking just at the level of generalities and abstractions. We have to meet each discipline on its own terrain, but we have to meet it from this larger perspective. And uh, it would be a different argument about each social science in turn. They're not all the same. They're all different. I will not. Um announce my name uh, for fear that it will not translate. Um, I'm a construction worker on a tower. Uh -huh. And I uh, 
my metier is limited to the language that I speak. And that language is not just words. It is, a, it is multiple genres of equipment, of tools, uh -huh. of skills, in which I create, but also to which my imagination, my ability to transcend is limited. This tower has many other people like me, and they all speak in languages, languages that often I do not understand. Yes. In fact, I do not know what the name of this tower is. Some I have heard call it Babel. Each of us, I must believe, works their imagination in the form of the language and the skills and the equipment that they're able to handle and build. Yet, I am told that my imagination is not enough because it does not translate. Perhaps I have even heard that the gods are angry and there is a god that would strike down this tower for fear that the imagination that I have is not adequate to build the tower that he wants. I cannot bring myself to believe in such a God. That's just to come. So, but what's, what, what, is the cons what is the programmatic implication of your comment? Because one possible response is to say, despite the fact that we're all stuck in these different situations with these different languages, we can attempt, depending on our circumstances, to find a way to talk to one another and to talk about something more general. So in the education of educated people, two, uh, two ways of doing that are through literature, which is a general language about human experience, and through philosophy, which deals with the most fundamental ideas in our civilization. And we, we, we have to do that. And uh, it's, it's something that I would recommend to everyone. Uh, just as we're all, we're all hostage to the provincial intellectual influences of our time, of our situation, of our disciplines. And we have to equip ourselves with means to resist those influences. Every educated person can do that. So, one way in which you can, one of the things you can do is you can study the history of philosophy. And then you can choose two or three thinkers and read everything the thinker ever wrote to form your mind in opposition to his. And this, it's, like, then it's like a rocket leaving the gravitational field. And you acquire some distance from the immediate intellectual situation. And then you be, are more able to speak across these intellectual frontiers. So it's not as if the situation that you describe were, not, were a situation that we could do nothing about. We can do things about it. And, the, and, and these measures that we take are themselves liberating. They allow us to achieve distance so from well, everything is con well, everything is constricted in some way, but some ideas are more limited or limiting than others. So some of these philosophers wrote 2,000 years ago. They were translated into many different cultures and languages. So this is a language, and literature is the same thing. It's a language that crosses these barriers that deals with things that are fundamental. Now. And, and, uh, but it, it's, it's not as if we have an, a, a readily usable conception of philosophy. So, you know, there's, there's in, in, in the West, the classical conception of philosophy was it's a super science. And it's a super science in the service of self-help. So it claims to be above the special disciplines. And what is it for? It's mainly been an antidote to our 
are, are being terrified about the in, in, in irremediable flaws in the human condition. Our mortality, our groundlessness, like life is a dream, and our insatiability. We want the unlimited, and we're surrounded only by the limited. So philosophy is a kind of narcotic, this classical view. Now we have another view of philosophy in the Anglo-American Academy, that it's a thought police. And it's to teach people what arguments are good arguments and bad arguments. It's a shrunken idea of philosophy. So, and no one wants to hire the services of that police, so it just talks by itself. Uh, so we, we, need, we, we need another conception of philosophy, that philosophy is neither of these things. It's not the super science in the service of self-help. Uh, it's not the thought police. It's the mind at war. Uh, trying to, 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 insisting on its prerogative to speak about what matters most, but reaching the limits of what is thinkable and of what is sayable, uh, and relativizing the distinctions among the disciplines. So this is all, that's an example of an intellectual practice, which has the promise or the potential to limit our confinement and our inability to speak to one another. So I think that all of these problems that we're discussing are problems that we can act on. They're actionable. Uh, a fundamental mistake in the psychology of hope is that we all tend to think that hope is the cause of action. But the truth is that hope is largely the consequence of action. So by acting, intellectually or practically, we discover transformative opportunity. Uh, we, there seems to be a wall. When we get close, we see the wall is full of cracks and contradictions. And as a result of action, acting, we become hopeful. And, that's, uh, and, and we, th this is the way in which we should attempt to change our, our, our state of mind by, by acting. So you saw your problem, that we're confined, that we can't talk to one another. I say there are ways of going about this problem. There are, there are flaws in these. These are all flawed or imperfect solutions. But by acting on them, we will discover more solutions. And our whole attitude to our circumstance will begin to change. And that's, uh, that's a very important part of my of my argument here tonight. There were two questions in the middle, sorry. Uh, first of all, thank you for this stimulating conversation. Um, my question to you, you mentioned uh, just now at some moment in, in the subsequent uh, conversation, uh, the, situ the political situation in Brazil right now. Uh, but at least in, in terms of the, the recent, more recent experience, Brazil was heralded as this example of participatory democracy and transformative demo democratic practices through participatory councils or participatory budgeting and other types of experiences. And I'm curious whether in your reading, uh, these are examples of the kind of imagination in power or transformative practice uh, that you were talking about. Not really. I mean, we, it's very, very marginal, very subsidiary. We haven't, you know, we've, I don't know whether this is really opposite to our discussion, our central discussion here. It's just an example of the kind of thing that happens in the world. So uh, Brazil is like the United States. It's the country in the world that's most like the United States, full of life. And our historical tragedy is to have denied to the majority of our people the instruments with which to turn this vitality into constructive action. So in political economy, we have had two main projects. One project has been worshiping at the altar of financial confidence. So do everything that the finance markets want, and then money will come. That doesn't work. It's never worked anywhere in the world. Uh, we need to fiscal realism, but not to win financial confidence for the opposite reason. So as not to depend on financial confidence and to be able to be bold in crafting a rebellious strategy of national development. Then we have another political economy which has 
uh, use the natural resources of the country to subsidize the consumption of the masses. So it's democratized the economy on the demand side or the consumption side, but not on the, uh, uh, not on the supply side, not on the production side. So our economy has regressed. It has deindustrialized. Uh, we bet on the easy riches of nature rather than on the products of the human mind. And we're sinking into primitivism. And around this system of national consumptionism, we've organized a system of co-option. So the workers get the transfers of the social programs. The organized minority of the labor force gets its vested rights. The big industrialists get the subsidized credit and the tax favors of the state. The rentiers get the astronomical interest rate. Everyone is bought off. And the, the, country, the country goes to the dogs. The country sinks. It deindustrializes it, 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 in, into this primitivism. So basic problem of Brazil is not that there's fascism. The basic problem is that there's mediocrity in a country that's full of life. Uh, and so we have to change this. Uh, and all this stuff about the, these little things of the participation and so forth, it's just icing on the cake. It doesn't deal with any of these central structural problems of the country. It's a kind of proceduralism that hasn't changed the organization of either our politics or our economic order. Good question. Hello. It's hard to agree with the ends of what, it's hard to disagree with the ends of what you're saying, but I have a struggle about the means and to how to bring it uh, to, to the reality. And it, a lot of what you say reminds me of a, a messenger that once came and said and announced that God is dead. And to go by Nietzsche's terms, how do we walk the rope to the Ubermensch? And uh, it's the opposite. It's the opposite. My whole spirit here is the spirit that transformation can be broken up into pieces, into steps. That it's not a system. That it's not all or nothing. And that once you understand this, so each of these areas that I spoke about, politics, the economy, education, each of them is a different site of struggle. And, and in each of them, it's not all or nothing. It's you, 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 you have a project. The project goes in this direction. And uh, it, there, it, there are real interests that can support it. That was the argument about alternative ways of representing a group interest. I'm not, this, this is why it's so anti-Marxist. It's not the description of some, some grand system. It's either this system or it's another system. There's capitalism or there's an alternative to capitalism. I don't think that way. And uh, everything that I discussed is structural and piecemeal at the same time. And this should be appealing to an American. Now, the Americans have a problem. So uh, the American prophets had this message, the divinity of the ordinary person. And the message from these prophets, Emerson, Whitman, Lincoln, uh, was tainted in two ways. So one way is an inadequate understanding of the relation between self-construction and solidarity. The Americans have been perennially tempted to think of the individual as a little Napoleon who crowns himself. After he crowns himself, he becomes generous. That's not the nature of self-construction. There's an internal relation between self-construction and solidarity. The second taint on the American prophetic message is institutional idolatry. The Americans are tempted to think that they discovered at the time of the foundation of their republic the definitive form of a free society, which has to be only uh, adjusted from time to time under the provocation of crisis. The rest of humanity must either subscribe to this formula or continue to languish in poverty and despotism. This is, a, this is anathema. This is a complete heresy. Uh, it's, it's a form of idolatry. And uh, it's been opposed in the United States by great American thinkers from, De from Jefferson to Dewey, uh, 
who tried to convince their fellow citizens to lift the exemption that they accord to the institutions from the experimentalist impulse that is otherwise so alive in American culture. So it has to change. And you, you, you have to have this idea that the country can reinvent itself in its structure and not simply in reallocating entitlements and rights from here to there and so forth. So if you do these things, if you progress in this direction, you have the answer to your question. It's, it's piece by piece. It's step by step in each of these fields. That's, that's the whole spirit of my discourse here. Of course, in this conversation, we don't have the time, we don't have the opportunity to enter into the, the details of, uh, of, of any of this. So look, here's, here's another way of saying why I, I disagree with this idea of, of paralysis as the message. Now in the world, anywhere in the world, if I present to you something that's close to what exists, you're likely to say, that's very interesting, but it's utopian. If I present something that's close to what exists, you're likely to say, that's feasible, but it's trivial. So everything that can be proposed is likely to be derided as either trivial or utopian. Now, that's a misunderstanding of the nature of transformation and of a programmatic argument. It's not about blueprints. It's about successions of steps. It's not architecture. It's music. And so any trajectory that's worth exploring can be explored at a point that's close to what exists or far away from what exists. And in, in a programmatic argument like I had tonight, we generally prefer the middle parts, neither close nor far, because they lend themselves to conceptual clarification. But in practical politics, we don't like the middle parts because they tend to be too close to what exists to arouse enthusiasm, but too far away to seem feasible. And that's why in practical political discourse, we emphasize the very close and the very far away. So the discourse of transformative politics is both practical and prophetic. Now, this false dilemma is aggravated in our contemporary circumstance by a feature of the intellectual history, which is that we no longer have a credible, usable way of thinking about how structural change and structural alternatives happen. So there are these theories, like Marxism, and they continue to use the vocabulary, class conflict, capitalism, but they don't believe in the assumptions of the vocabulary in which they're speaking. So we, because we don't have a credible way of thinking about structural change, we fall back on a bastardized conception of political realism, which is that something is realistic to the extent that it's close to what already exists. That's preposterous. That's not a criterion of realism. That's a declaration of intellectual bankruptcy. And, and so that's, that's the situation in which everything begins to seem impossible because it's utopian, because it's trivial. Let's discard all of that. That's a bunch of superstitions. And that's just, it's the result of our confusion. You know, the narrator in Proust says, we are friends with those whose ideas are at the same level of confusion as our own. That's where we all are. Our, our affinities are determined by this, by the, by the equality and the level of confusion. So we need clarification. Yeah, I just had a, a brief question. Could you speak more on this, on this taste, this taste for Marxism? The reason, number one, is that you seem to suggest that academia in, in this country was populated by, by Marxists. And, you know, I, no, I no. The rest of the world. Oh, okay. well, yeah, the rest of the world. In my country, for example, there are almost as many Marxists as there are American-style social scientists. Uh, and I'd say good riddance to both, both groups. Uh, yeah, so, so, much, so my second question is that I, you know, and, and perhaps this is, you know. But let, but let, me, correct the, the, let me correct the reference to Marx before right. you get to your second question. 
I doubt that any living person, any living social thinker, is closer to Karl Marx than I am. I, I will dispute anyone's credential. On, 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 the essential, on the essential point, on the essential point, which is society is made and imagined. The structures are not natural. This was the essential point in Marxism, that the, the English political economists claimed that the laws of their economy were the universal laws of the economy. Now, the trouble is that in Marx's operation, this revolutionary insight into the made and imagined character of social life was circumscribed by a series of deterministic illusions, that there's a closed menu of regimes in history, that each of them is an indivisible system, that there are laws governing their foreordained succession. So the tendency of the neo-Marxists has been to water down these heroic necessitarian claims. And now, and I have the opposite tendency. I want to radicalize the original central insight into the artifactual character of social life, but to get rid of all the necessitarian illusions and to have a different account of constraint. I'm not saying that constraint doesn't exist. We've, we've been discussing constraint here for, for, for an hour and a half, but, but an account which doesn't present constraint as the expression of this idea that history has a script. So, yes, but if I may, the, the, the letters Marx sends to the Paris Image of 1783 towards the end of his life are specifically about the agency of movements and even the first yes. of, of the Jews were married, men make their own Yes, 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 yes. yes. So my second question is regarding this, right? So you, you, you seem to claim, correct me if I'm wrong, that socialists and Marxists lack a vision, and yet, you know, if you read even the critique of the Gotha program, it seems quite quite obvious that you know the idea is just to uh, submit the the society's surpluses and their investment to democratic will rather than to the profit of private rentiers, and and that seems to me, you know, simply a, a form of of goal towards a human emancipation, which is the there's no, yeah, I disagree. I disagree. There's, I, there's, there's a, a minimalist programmatic thinking in Marx, because, and there must be, and he himself said why. Because he said, we don't invent programs. That's what the utopian socialists do. We think there's a real dialectic in history. History generates the program, and, and, and the and, and the programmatic elements are minimalist. So for example, take the central question of the predominance of wage labor as the form of free labor. And uh, in the 19th century, it wasn't just Karl Marx. All the liberals thought that wage labor was a defective and ephemeral form of free work, retaining many of the characteristics of slavery and serfdom. Then comes the practical question. How are we to reconcile the, the higher forms of free labor, self-employment and cooperation, with the imperative of economies of scale? We, ha we have to be able to innovate in the regimes of property and contract, in the construction of private law. So there is a detailed alternative institutional architecture for decentralized access to the means of production. It can't be swept under the rug of some generality like social decision. We have to actually design it and say how we get from here to there, what are the legal alternatives. What Marx actually believed is that much of this discussion would be rendered superfluous by the overcoming of the reign of scarcity. And he was absolutely mistaken, he and Keynes that we're about to overcome scarcity. So they both thought two wrong things. First, that we're about to overcome scarcity. And second, that work is a hateful burden and that we, we can only achieve freedom from the economy, not really freedom in the economy. I believe, to the contrary, that we're not about to overcome scarcity and that we can aspire to freedom in the economy by reorganizing the market order, and not just freedom from the economy, 
through the overcoming of scarcity. So we have a series of disputes. And all these disputes touch on the availability or not of detailed institutional alternatives. So that's just part of the background. None of that impugns the fundamental sympathy and affinity with Karl Marx against the neo-Marxists. Roberto, you have to decide how many more questions you can take. <laughs> we could just continue the conversation informally. We don't have to okay. continue it in this situation. Uh, this is very generous of you, and we continue informally. Thank, Thank you very you much. Thank you very much.